please indulge me for just a moment um, before you tell me how much time I have. Let me make a few preparatory remarks. Uh, no, I'm not going to let you make a few preparatory remarks. Then tell you how much time you have. Uh, you have. I'll just tell you this: you are a party presenting a motion. You present it adequately without being overly burdensome on our time. That's that's your limitation. Thank you, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> Gentlemen, before I begin my substantive presentation, I want to tell you that I'm not here to throw hand grenades. But I do have what I consider to be very important issues to bring to this august body's attention. I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of what I'm going to tell you today by saying that the evidence that I'm going to present to you and have presented to you shows an institution, the Department of Public Safety and Corrections, Office of State Police, as an agency in disarray. More particularly, what I'm going to show you gentlemen today is going to demonstrate that the Louisiana State Police is a racketeering enterprise. I know those are inflammatory words, but I didn't make the facts. The facts have been made for me by that body. I'll mention a few names before I get into the substance of my presentation. Reeves, Noel, Kane, Flincham, and Morrison. Remember those names. What do they have in common? They have in common. And, and Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, I will let you do your presentation. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as to what the authority of this commission is. This commission has authority to uh, take appeals relative to discipline of classified employees. This commission has authority to issue discipline for a violation of our rules relative to classified employees. And this commission has time limits within which it can operate. So but subject to that, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I understand all of that, but in direct response to your observation, Mr. Chairman, I would merely state that because an individual is no longer in the active state police service does not mean that you are constrained from asking questions of and about that individual in order to determine whether or not this commission's rules have been violated or whether rules have been violated by the Office of Public Safety and Corrections, Office of State Police. That's all part of my presentation. And while we're on that subject, I know and you know that Colonel Reeves has retired, that Chief of Staff Kane is still in the active service, and I'm going to give you another name that I didn't know until May the 26th when Captain Manali divulged it to me that he's still employed by the state police, John Nelson. His name will come up again in a few minutes. He remains on active service. He's a sergeant now. He was a trooper when I was brutalized. I know that Ms. Morrison appeared before this body for years, maybe not before you gentlemen. I, I don't know how her term as with the Office of Legal Counsel coincided with your own, but she appeared here many, many times for years 
And I don't think anyone ever asked her during any of her representation of the state police about her obvious conflict of interests by virtue of the fact that her husband was a ranking state trooper the entire time. Mark Morrison, he may not be on the force any longer, but he was a major uh, when he retired or left the service. Um, and it's ironic that, she, that her name figures prominently in what I'm going to tell you all today. And it would be very ironic that you know, a technicality, well, she wasn't in the active state police service, so therefore we had no jurisdiction over her, when she appeared before you all for years, representing the state police. All right, I've gotten that off my chest. Um, I want to start off by telling you gentlemen, I'm not here to throw hand grenades. I'm here to help you discharge your sworn duty. I don't know any of you personally, and I concede that I believe I owe each of you an apology. I went back and I read in preparation for the day what I submitted to you styled formal charges, requests for investigation, and exercise of empowerment, which although dated February 14, 2022, was actually perfected when the mail was picked up from the post office box here in Baton Rouge on February the 18th of 2022. I used some language in that formal charge and request for investigation that was inflammatory, and for that I apologize. Uh, I believe each of you to be an honorable man, borrowing from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And I know, because I heard the oath that the new member took this morning, that you all will faithfully do what must be done to discharge your obligation under that oath. Now, the thing that I'm here to talk to you all about today is a common denominator between my case and the Ronald Green case. I use the term racketeering enterprise. I know there are at least a couple of lawyers on the panel, and some of you have law enforcement background. I know that you've heard the terms before, pattern of behavior, standard of conduct, modus operandi. Uh, I don't know what other buzzwords I could use. Oh, predicate acts. The common denominators between my case and the Ronald Green case are, remember the names that I gave you all, um, Cain, I'm sorry, Reeves, Noel, Cain, Flinchman, Morrison. Remember the terms cover up. Why are we here today? I'm not here today to talk about, excuse me, you all said on your agenda that you're here to discuss investigative proceedings regarding allegations of misconduct, namely that the state police engaged in criminal conduct and violated his civil rights in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. That was 17 years ago. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. You've heard the expression, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. Focus on the cover-up aspects, although you've got to know what happened to me in order to understand the big picture. What was done to me and what was done to Ronald Green were both horrible. He died. 
I was only pepper sprayed 30 to 40 times while my hands were cuffed behind my back. I was only shot in both thighs a total of 12 times at point blank range with a 12-gauge shotgun loaded with beanbag rounds um, while my hands were cuffed behind my back or behind a Guantanamo-style dog cage. Who did that to me? I was abducted from my home by, guess who? F Troop. Where have you heard F Troop before? Who murdered Ronald Green? F Troop. From where? Monroe. Who came to my house and abducted me for nothing? Because there was nothing illegal happening on my property. F Troop. In 17 years of litigating and adjudicating in legal and quasi-judicial proceedings with the Louisiana State Police, I was given a grand total of two names and one scrap of paper. 17 years. I got the name John Nelson, who was a state trooper, badge number 2227. And I got the name Christopher Ivy. I got one piece of paper. You can attribute two names and one piece of paper in 17 years to the blue code of silence. But I don't attribute it to that at all. I attribute it to what I call predicate acts, a pattern of activity or behavior, standard operating procedure, modus operandi, MO, and cover up. And it is no coincidence that the Louisiana State Police, through Colonel Davis, Ms. Gail Holland, who ain't here today, and Captain Manali is in default on a Louisiana Public Records Act request that I submitted to them on February 5th, 2022. I've gotten nothing from them since then. But you, you do realize that there, there are laws that govern the Louisiana Freedom of Information Act and public re records requests that we don't have jurisdiction over. You take that to district court and the district court will enforce those laws and issue whatever is appropriate. Yes, sir. Those laws. I understand that. And I'm telling you that they are in default. The item number is OLA 076476. In short, I'm being stonewalled again. Okay? Now, what is a policeman? I have authority no less compelling than the Supreme Court of the United States in a 1968 case, the name of which is Broderick versus Gardner. I don't know if you've ever heard of it previously. But in it, Abe Fortas, who was a liberal, I'm a conservative, but you've heard of Mr. Justice Fortas, said, a policeman is directly, immediately, and entirely responsible to the city or state which is his employer. He owes his entire loyalty to it. He has no other client or principal. He is the trustee of the public interest, bearing the burden of great and total responsibility to his employer. Unlike the lawyer, he is directly responsible to his client. The policeman is either responsible to the state or to no one. Who is the state with respect to the Louisiana State Police? You are, gentlemen. You are the Louisiana State Police Commission. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the state and of the United States. You are the state. 
Nobody stands between the policeman and the public except you. And that, I respectfully suggest, is an awesome responsibility. Now, why do I bring that to your attention? Because just as Mr. Chairman stated very accurately, without any disagreement from me, that your rule, I'm sorry, your article and rules vest in you the power to investigate cases of criminal misconduct by state policemen. Not only individuals, but the quote, Office of State Police within the Department of Public Safety and Corrections. Particularly in this case, where the appointing authority, and I'm talking about my case now, refused to act. You're going to find out in just a few minutes that Reeves, it actually started with Edmondson and Dupuy, Edmondson, Dupuy, Reeves, Noel, Kane, Flincham, and Morrison, to whom I reported not only misconduct, but criminal misconduct, refused to act. They, in, a sense, in essence, told me, go fly a kite at Kite O'Dwyer. We're not acting on your complaints. When that happens, you are the only body that I can come before. And I'm going to show you that I actually made the attempt. Now, I have gone through your rules, your article and rules, very carefully. And I submitted to you all, in addition to the formal charges that are embodied in that February 18, 2022 submission, a lengthy <coughs> written submission that I gave to Mr. Hanneman, which each of you should have access to today. There's a copy for each of you. That's my written presentation. It's 52 separately numbered paragraphs. Um, there are four additional exhibits. That is, in addition to one through nine, that were submitted to the original formal charges. You've got four more, 10 through 13. Those things constitute evidence. Please, gentlemen, in your leisure time, when you are doing your sworn duty, please read my materials. I'm not gonna read all of that to you today. I'm keeping it as short as I possibly can. But the analysis of your rules falls within paragraphs numbers 13 and 21. I don't claim to be any smarter than any of you are. But if you want to take a look at a good summary of your rules, which lay out in black and white the power that you all hold under the Constitution, article and rules, read my numbered paragraphs 13 through 30, 13 through 21, excuse me. Particularly rule 2.9C, which I'm gonna to read to you right now, which empowers you to conduct investigations Remember what the chairman told me, I agree with him 100%. Whenever it has reason to believe the provisions of the state police service article or rules are being violated or have been violated by any person, then it says, or Department of Public Safety and Corrections, comma, Office of State Police. That's a very, very broad grant of power conferred by the provisions of Rule 2.9C. 
make sure that that is emblazoned in the fleshy tablets forever more. Now, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the above referenced article and rules are breathtakingly broad in scope and demonstrate that you enjoy great power should you choose to exercise that power which vests in you, I'm not going to read it again, rule 2.9c. To conduct investigations when it has reason to believe that the provisions of the state police service article or rules are being violated or have been violated by any person or Department of Public Safety and Corrections Office of State Police. Now, I said that we're here to talk about not what only happened to me, but also what happened to Ronald Green between the same, because the same MO for covering things up was employed by the same people for the same purposes, cover-up. The common denominators in the Green case and my case being f true and cover-up. What brought the Green case to my attention? Why should Ashton O'Dwyer, who was brutalized with his civil rights being violated by the state police f troop 17 years ago, why should that grab his attention um, recently? <clears throat> it grabbed my attention because I heard the names Reeves, Noel, Kane, Flincham, and Morrison being brought up before Tanner McGee's House committee investigating the circumstances of the death of Ronald Green time and time again. I was reading Mr. Tom Aswell's blog, Louisiana Voice, and I saw these names and I said, wow, this rings a bell. And sure enough, I remembered that in my own case, after I had brought to Colonel Edmondson's and Colonel Dupuy's attention the violation of my civil rights back in 2017, back 17 years ago, excuse me, in 2005, I brought those things to their attention in 2015. The guy who was running the show at that time a, a, a DA from Monroe named Fred McGahey, uh, who interacted with F Troop all the time, he takes Nelson's deposition, and guess what? Nelson lies at his deposition. He commits perjury. And I said, wait a minute. He can't get away with this. He's a state trooper. Uh, he lied at a deposition. I got to let the state police know about this. I got to let them know that this guy not only lied at a deposition in 2015, he brutalized me back in 2017, 2005. Pardon me. <clears throat> I put all this together and I submitted to Colonel Edmondson and Colonel Dupuy who don't do diddly squat with it. So, in frustration, the, the change of the guard is about to happen, and I find out about the existence of the Louisiana State Police Committee, and I write a letter to Ms. Dearborn that is, 
exhibit number 10, which is in the submission that I gave to Mr. Hanneman today, I talked to her on the telephone and I explained to her that Colonel Edmondson, Colonel Dupuy, and Ms. Flincham are all conspiring along with Assistant District Attorney Fred McGahey of Washita Parish to obstruct justice and cover up the wrongdoing in my case. Accordingly, Ms. Dearborn, I am requesting an independent investigation of my allegations against Nelson. This is all laid out in O'Dwyer Exhibit Number 10, which Mr. Hanneman has and which you will have shortly. It doesn't take her long to act on my request. What did she tell me? By letter dated July 21, 2016, which is A-Rod exhibit number 11, she says, quote, we have reviewed your complaint today wherein you requested an independent investigation pursuant to chapter 16 be initiated to investigate the allegations of one, a violation of your civil rights. Two, perjury by a member of the state police service during a deposition. And three, conspiracy to obstruct justice by the superintendent and assistant superintendent. Pursuant to SPC Rule 16.1, any person may file with the director of the commission written charges. Unfortunately, the alleged conduct is not governed by the article of the rules. <clears throat> she brushed me off, just like Colonel, Colonel Edmondson and Colonel Dupuy brushed me off. Now I ask you, if I can't get the Colonel and the lieutenant colonel to act on the investigation of my complaints. And I can't get the commission to act on the investigation of my complaints. Who can I ask to act on the investigation of my complaints when the governing authority has dodged the issue? What is my remedy? back to you all again today. We're and I'm, going in excess of 25 minutes now. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... I want you to have full opportunity to address this. I, I understand and I sincerely to, appreciate it. To, 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 uh, try I to sincerely back. appreciate it. Where we are in my presentation right now is I have identified for you who brutalized me. I have identified you who failed to act in my case. I have identified to you who attempted to cover up things in my case. I told you that we are here because of the similarities in my case and the similarities in the Ronald Green case. Who are the Ronald Green cover-up artists? And I mean no disrespect to the commission, but unless you gentlemen have been living under a rock, it should be apparent from the publicity that particularly the McGee investigation has uncovered, which is still being uncovered, and which has been written about at length by Mr. Aswell on his blog and by James Gill in The Advocate in an article that I cited to you all. 
that in the Ronald Green case, certain current and former state policemen participated in a massive cover-up about what actually transpired on a state highway in Washita Parish, I'm sorry, in Union Parish on May 10, 2019. Who are they? They are Reeves, Kane, Noel, Flincham, and Morris. Who are the cover-up artists in my case? I submit to you, they are Reeves, Kane, Noel, aided and abetted by Flincham and Morrison, just like in the Reeves case. Doing what? Engaging in a systematic pattern of behavior by the commission of predicate acts in accordance with standard operating procedure, a modus operandi to cover things up. It happened in my case, and it happened in the Ronald Green case, and it involved the exact same people employing the same M.O. Now where does this leave us? And we're coming to the end, I promise you, Mr. Chairman. Number one, suppose, just suppose, that the Louisiana State Police top brass, like Edmondson, Dupuy, Reeves, Noel, and Kane, had acted on my formal charges and request to investigate when I first submitted that request to them. Suppose they had acted. Might the rank and file, including the guys at F Troop, have gotten the message that serious allegations of criminal misconduct of any type would be dealt with swiftly and decisively instead of covered up as usual. Ditto for legal counsel Faye Morrison, who was appearing routinely before this body, although she may not have actually appeared before any of you gentlemen, because her term and your terms didn't overlap. Nobody even raised her conflict of interests with her. This is the same Faye Morrison who Mr. Aswell recently wrote is involved in rehiring cadets from the training academy who were fired because of their involvement in a cheating scandal. Have you all done anything about that? Do you know about it? And if the state police had failed to act, suppose Ms. Dearborn had acted when I sent my letter to her back in July of 2017. If the brass hadn't acted within the state police, but the commission did, would the rank and file have gotten the message that included F Troop that covering things up and engaging in criminal acts was verboten? And that if the brass wouldn't do anything about it, you guys would, because you have the, the power to investigate any person and the agency itself. And of course, those questions all lead to the most obvious next question, namely was, which is, had Ms. Dearborn acted and the commission acted when she failed to act, might Ronald Green be alive today because the guys in F Troop would have thought twice before what they did to him on that state highway in Union Parish on May 10, 2019. Now we get to the end. Rule 16.5, which says that you gentlemen may go into our you, you, you should go into executive session. Rule 
is very, very broad. This is another one that should be committed to your memory and emblazoned in the fleshy tablets. It says, once you go into executive session, you have the sole discretion to take any action as it that you deems appropriate. In its sole discretion, the commission may take any such action as it deems appropriate. That is very, very broad, gentlemen. I'm not going to invade your province by suggesting to you what you should do. You're the ones that took the oath, not me. But you all have an opportunity here that most of us don't get, and that is a second chance. You are now presented with another opportunity to take action. The rhetorical question is, will the commission fish or cut bait? What am I telling you? One, I'm telling you that I believe the commission has original jurisdiction to determine a state police disciplinary matter involving an individual trooper, no matter what his rank is, particularly where the appointing authority and the office of state police have failed to act and obstructed justice so the matter could remain covered up. Number two, I believe that you have original jurisdiction to conduct investigations whenever you have reason to believe that the provisions of a state police service article or rules are being violated or have been violated by any person or Department of Public Safety and Corrections Office of State Police, the institution itself, gentlemen, and to issue appropriate orders in any such case. And even if the commission has never utilized its original jurisdiction, that does not mean the commission lacks the power. One more minute. Look at the power enumerated in, article, in paragraphs 13 to 21 of what I submitted to you in writing. And that includes the power to ask questions of anybody you want whether they're currently in the state police service or not, in order to enact your powers or discharge your duties under your powers. And if the commission fails to act in the face of no action whatsoever by the state police except the obstruction of justice and cover-up, then who will the policeman The state police, which is the trustee of the public trust, be required to answer to and be responsible to, who the Supreme Court has said is answerable to the state. Who will that policeman answer to if not you gentlemen? That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mr. I hope it's made an impression on you. I have one more thing to say. I don't control what you all do in executive session, but I am available to answer any questions that you wish to put to me 24-7. I'm reachable by telephone or email at any time, day or night. And I've also been told that it is even within your province to decide the matters that I have presented to you here today in public session 
rather than in executive session. I don't know what rule that is, but that's what I've been told. Perhaps you know. I don't want to step on any of your toes here. I'm making myself available to you to try to assist you in any way you think I can to help you reach a just and right decision in this case. Yes. And did you appeal the decision? It, it appears that the uh, uh, that, that you requested it an investigation and it was denied. Did you yes, appeal? Mr. Hanneman has that correspondence. I have it. We've been presented that. All right. Did you appeal that decision to the uh, to the appropriate court? It's no. I never went to court. I did not go to court. Ms. Dearborn, I respectfully submit, informed me or gave me the brush off erroneously. I am asking this body to revisit the same issue that was presented to Ms. Dearborn in 2017 in light of what has been revealed about the Ronald Green case and the similarities between my case and the Ronald Green case, and do the right thing this time. My last communication with Ms. Dearborn is embodied in my exhibit, A-Rod exhibit number 13, which is in the package that I gave Mr. Hanneman today. In addition to that, to get to your specific question, there was additional communication between me and Mr. Hanneman that I didn't give you guys, but which Mr. Hanneman has access to. Does that answer Mr. your question? Mr. Hanneman, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, with what you're referring to, Mr. Or what would additional communication beyond the original documentation that's stemmed through between, your charges? But beyond the original documentation between me and Ms. Dearborn, I believe you and I exchanged some communications. I don't have my computer with me today in this room. I have it at, at the hotel, but I, I, will, I, will, I will refresh your recollection. Well, we'll, ask Ms. we'll ask Ms. Hanneman's researches. I'm assuming you're talking about emails. Email or correspondence, well, and, if you, and if you have anything additional, you can submit it to us. But all right, we'll I, I'm, I'm trying to to answer Mr. Commissioner Knapp's question. I don't know what's going through your mind. I don't know whether you're thinking res judicata, collateral estoppel. I don't know what you think. I'm just trying to answer your question. There was additional communication after Ms. Dearborn and I. Uh, communicated the last time she shut me down. Anybody else? You all have an opportunity to do the right thing again. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. Moves and second. Roll call. Mm -hmm. Brian Crawford? Yes. Leonard Knapp? Yes. <laughs> Monty Montalongo. Yes. Carol Corey. Yes. Jerry. I did. You listen. Yes. I make a motion that we take this matter under advisement. Uh, Mr. O'Dwyer has given us lots of information that we need to get through, go through. Um, we need to ensure that we have before us, and then I know we've been provided some, maybe all, but Mr. Hanneman is going to check to make sure that we have all of the information that you provided to him so that we can fully evaluate and, and review this matter. Um, but we had your presentation, but we're going to take it under advice. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Second. 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion of the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The, the ayes have it. So you'll be hearing back from us. <laughs>